Back in January of 2019, I published a video, which I will link above here, showing my calculations of how long I anticipated it would take for my 6.38 kilowatts of grid-tied solar panels to produce enough electricity to pay for themselves. In that video, I estimated that it would break even in five years and nine months. My system went online in August of 2017, and here we are five years and nine months later. So, has it broken even yet? In my prior video, this is the spreadsheet that I went over where I documented the amount of electricity produced in 2018 so that I could get a feel for how much my solar system was able to produce and I anticipated roughly getting the same amount of electricity in the future. And then I looked at the government figures over here and saw that for Utah, the average price per kilowatt hour was 10.95 cents. And then I also talked about Rocky Mountain Power's method of billing electricity and block rates, etc. So like I said, if you're interested in more information about that, then go watch that prior video. If nothing had changed since then, it would be really easy for me just to tell you right now, yes or no, on whether or not I have broken even. However, my system has changed since then. In July of 2019, I added an additional 3.6 kilowatts of solar panels, bringing my system size to 9.98 kilowatts. In July 2020, I published a video, which I will link above on the cost of my system expansion if you'd like more details on that project. Since the solar panels are all part of the same system, I have no way to differentiate power from the different solar arrays, nor do I really see the need to. The expansion uses the same inverter from the first array as well as other costs that went into the first system. Really, all I did was add additional solar panels in the expansion project. For this reason, basically, we just need to add up the costs of both phases of my solar system, then project a new break-even time estimate. This is a new spreadsheet that I've created which combines all of the information into one place. I wanted to point out first right here that the combined cost came to $9,735. Now keep in mind this was a DIY project, I did not hire this out, so this does not include my labor, but it has all of the parts in here and all of their expenses. That comes out to 97 cents per watt of installed solar. Starting from August of 2017 through April of 2023, our system has now produced 80,605 kilowatt hours of electricity. If we simply calculate using the same average of 10.95 cents per kilowatt hour as before, then we have 7.1 more months before we break even. That projects that we'll break even the first week of December 2023. The entire time to break even will have been six years, three months, and about 22 days. But keep in mind, if I had initially installed the entire 9.98 kilowatt solar array, then the break even period would have been closer to six years or slightly less. I was curious if electricity has changed very much since I did my calculations in the last video. And I found a website called Find Energy, which has more precise information showing the average price per kilowatt hour by the month and for three different cities in Utah County where I am. I decided to check these numbers against the 10.95 cents figure to see how much variance there might be in this break-even time estimate. I calculated using the numbers from the city of Orem because it is the closest city to me that is on Pacific Corp, which is my same electricity provider. The average price per kilowatt hour is 10.7 cents, so not much different and adds about a month to the break-even period. This website also has the entire state of Utah listed as having an average price per kilowatt hour of 10.97 cents, which would make the break-even period just under seven months. This gives me a pretty narrow margin of up to a month of variance in my accuracy, and I'm happy with that. I anticipate these panels will continue working for many decades to come, and aside from some maintenance costs, such as replacing the inverter or perhaps a power optimizer at some point in the future, there will be minimal costs going forward, I anticipate. Up to this point, all hardware has continued to function properly, so there haven't been any maintenance costs yet. Now that I've given you the high level information about this spreadsheet, let me just show you briefly how I put this together in case it helps you in your own break-even calculation decisions. So across the top here, I have the summation of all of the different calculations, and then the core of the data is these columns down here. So starting in August of 2017 is when my system went online. And so what I have here is obviously the year, the month, and then the price per kilowatt hour. And I'm getting that from this website, which you can see here is, is linked in the um, first row here if you want to go check that out. 
and as you mouse over that graph here, it, each month will show a different price as you mouse over it. So I took all of those prices per kilowatt hour per month, and I put those all the way down this first column here in this spreadsheet. It goes all the way down to April of 2023. Now the data actually stops showing up after January of 2023, so I just repeated the, uh, the, these three months, February through April of 2022. So then the next column is the production kilowatt hours, and I'm getting that information from the Solar Edge monitoring portal, and I've just simply entered in how many kilowatt hours it reports each month. And then in this cell, this is a calculation of basically just multiplying these cells against each other to show the resultant value or, or in dollars of that produced amount of electricity. And then over here, I have some notes. So then up here we have the average. So this is just an average of that first column, the price per kilowatt hour. And then we have the average amount of electricity produced in kilowatt hours per month. And that's the average for the whole time frame. It's because it's averaging all of these uh, months together. And then we have the average produced value per month. And that is a calculation of looking at all of these produced values and it's averaging those. Now, if we come up here, we have the total kilowatt hours, we have the total produced value, and that total produced value is basically just looking at the summation of all of those cells. And then we have break even of the phases. So that's just a, a number I've typed in from a, a different spreadsheet prior where I've combined all of the parts together and what they cost. And so then I am looking at this uh, here where I'm taking the amount that it's produced and I'm subtracting it from the total amount that I spent so that I can see the difference remaining of how much I still owe myself really and then over here we have the forecast in months remaining and that is basically just taking this amount and dividing it by that amount so basically we're breaking even in eight months because we're looking at an average amount of money that we earn from our solar panels and we're dividing the total amount we have remaining by that amount. Something that's important to note here is that obviously just because the solar panels produce the electricity doesn't mean that it actually brought us value if we didn't use it. We actually make sure to use all of the electricity within reason that we can per year. The way that our electricity net metering policy is structured, all the electricity that we pass into the grid, we can later pull back out of the grid at no cost. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. And then per month, there's about a $10 reoccurring just fee for having an account. But every year, the electricity that it remains on the net metering balance in the March billing cycle, it will just be reset to zero and they don't compensate us for it. They just reset it to zero and we lose it all. So I try really hard every year to use all of the electricity that we have in our net metering balance. And through the years, I've come up with the different options of ways that I can use the electricity. First, we got electric cars, and then we got a freeze dryer, and we, that uses a fair amount of electricity. And more recently, I've acquired a high-powered electric space heater that I plug into the dryer outlet and I heat the house with that to burn through excess electricity where needed. And there's other times where we're trying to conserve electricity and we're just trying to uh, strike a balance there of not going too far that we have to pay for electricity, but not leaving too much electricity on the table. Looking back through the last several years, you can see that we've been pretty close several times. 18 is the closest uh, that I've gotten, 18 kilowatt hours. And in March of 2020, um, things were... I got disrupted by current affairs in the world and <laughs> lost sight of the goal, wasn't driving as much, and we left 387 kilowatt hours on the table. So we've left a total of 652 kilowatt hours on the table, so to speak, that they have taken from us out of the 80,000 kilowatt hours produced over that time. One thing that has been hammered home for me over the years, I've had solar on my house as well as my RV solar project, which I built out in 2021, and I'll put a card above to a playlist of all of those videos, is that solar production varies dramatically depending on various conditions, such as the orientation of the solar panels to the sun, shade, temperature, and many other things. Even in a fixed installation like what's on the roof of my house, the weather causes the production to vary quite a bit. For instance, here is the monitoring portal for my solar edge uh, inverter, which is what's on the roof of my house. And down here, we can see the year over year energy production. And if you look at the years 2020 through 2022, these are all three years where my system size was the full 9.98 kilowatts of solar panels. 
This graph illustrates how the energy production has varied as low as 16,125 kilowatt hours, which was in 2021, and then 2022 was 16,412, and as high as 16,578 kilowatt hours in one year. Or if we come over here to the months, we can see the year over year of the various months. And if we look at January of 2022, the solar array produced 1,106 kilowatt hours. January of 2023, it only produced 514 kilowatt hours. That is a difference of 592 kilowatt hours or less than half the energy of the same month year over year. For my grid tied house solar, the variance isn't a big deal because the grid is our battery and typically our net metering balance peaks just over 1000 kilowatt hours and the balance is reset to zero once a year in March. Although in 2022, our net metering balance peaked at 2,821 kilowatt hours, which I attribute primarily to the fact that we now had the 2,650 watts of RV solar panels contributing to charging the Tesla and lessening the demand on our household electricity. I made a video going over all of the details of how I charge my Tesla from the RV solar panels, and I'll add a card above to that video if you're interested. Weather variance has a lot more impact on off-grid systems like our RV because the battery can only store 9.6 kilowatt hours of electricity in our specific RV. Obviously, we could use a generator or some other source of electricity in that case if needed. However, I designed my system to minimize or eliminate the need for a generator, so I installed more solar panels than normal for these less optimal solar days. Plus, I want the excess electricity for charging our future Cybertruck while we're on trips in sunny weather. I hope this has been helpful to see my calculations and my experience, and I wish you the best in your own solar journey. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.